Okay, hi there. Let's spend a few minutes looking at one of the issues in fiscal policy economics as part of your macroeconomics. Uh, we'll take a few moments to think about the concept of crowding out. Crowding out. Now, the crowding out hypothesis uh, is basically an idea that became sort of uber popular in the sort of 1970s and 1980s when a number of influential free market economists started to argue against sort of incremental rising share of GDP being taken by the public sector, being taken by the state. So essentially, the crowding out view is an argument against the use of fiscal policy activism by the government. Uh, supporters of the crowding out view believe that a rapid growth of government spending and borrowing uh, might cause a transfer of scarce factor inputs away from the private sector to the public sector where productivity might be lower. And the crowding out view goes further. They argue that if the government spends and borrows more, for example, to fund a fiscal stimulus, then eventually uh, what happens is that interest rates go up and or uh, taxes have to go up. Perhaps inflation goes up as well, which can then have a negative dampening effect on the private sector. So crowding out economists or supporters of the EU tend to be quite sceptical, indeed critical of the role of government as a key sort of fiscal policy activist agent in the economy. To so remind ourselves of government spending, spending by the public sector on public services such as education, healthcare, defence. We make a distinction, for example, between transfer payments, welfare spending such as universal credit, uh, public services, you know, spending on the pay of the police force, spending on materials used in education, drugs used in the NHS. And crucially, of course, investment projects. Oftentimes the government has some significant investment spending in transport, in, in uh, health care and education, in defence and much else besides. A couple of years ago, the UK government was spending around £750 billion in total. That's just over 43% of GDP. Now, crowding out economists would argue that that figure needs to come down. They would prefer government spending to be somewhere between, let's say, 35 to 40% of GDP, but no higher. It's worth remembering that just under a tenth of government spending is investment. Uh, totally, in total, government spending on public services, excluding um, transfer payments, excluding investment, is about one fifth, between a fifth and a quarter of GDP. So, the crowding out view argues against significant uh, deficit finance increases in, in government spending. Let's just work through the process of the argument. So the argument goes as follows. If the government decides to run a big budget deficit, for example, it might introduce a, a significant fiscal stimulus to the economy, then it will have to sell debt. That's the nature of, of deficit finance. So you have to issue government bonds. Then the argument goes that getting institutions, um, pension funds, insurance companies, foreign investors, etc., to buy the debt might actually require higher interest rates. There's a diagram we'll look at in a second for that. And equally, to get individual investors to buy the government debt in the form of a national savings, for example, you might have to index link the, the, the yield on a bond. So therefore, if governments borrow more and if, if interest rates go up, and that's the key evaluation point, if interest rates go up, then a rise in interest rates more generally uh, across the financial markets may then crowd out private sector investment, planned investment by businesses. And also, of course, higher interest rates might squeeze the housing market and dampen consumption, the key part of aggregate demand. So there's a crowding out effect through the interest rate channel. A related argument is that eventually, uh, if, you're, if you're significantly lifting government spending, that's going to have to be funded by higher taxes. The burden of taxation <clears throat> will have to go up. And again, a higher tax burden on the private sector, both individuals and companies, squeezes real disposable incomes and investment and, con and curtails the consumer spending. So the crowding out theorists, God bless them, crowding out theorists argue that a fiscal stimulus, a traditional Keynesian fiscal stimulus, is actually less effective in an expansion don't, don't, don't uh, try and stimulate the economy during an expansion phase. In particular, if you're close to full capacity, an increase in public demand crowds out private sector demand, and actually you might end up with output more or less the same <clears throat> in real terms, but you might also get some inflation. So the argument is that crowding out is that governments spending and borrowing more 
could actually have a dampening, damaging effect on private sector and worsens the prospects for the economy. Now, there's an analysis diagram that goes with the crowding out view. It's a diagram which has the real interest rate on the y-axis, the, the real return on saving or the real return on the real cost of a loan on the y-axis, and the quantity of loanable funds, money available in the financial system for banks and, and banks and building societies and, and others to lend out, the quantity of loanable funds on the x-axis. We've seen that the supply of loanable funds is positively related to the real interest rate, the, the in savings incentive of a higher return, and that the demand for loans is negatively related to the real interest rate. When loans are expensive, fewer people and companies want to borrow. When loans are cheap, more people are looking for a loan, perhaps a mortgage or a company, a company loan. Now, what happens if governments spend more? Well, if the spending is deficit financed, then you can draw the diagram thus, showing an increase in the demand for loanable funds, D2, and I've labelled that with extra government borrowing. So the government's an agent in the economy. They're going into the market looking to buy, looking to attract people to buy their bonds. There's a demand for loanable funds. And of course, there's a limited supply of loanable funds. If the demand shifts out, then you'd expect the real interest rate to go up from R1 to R2. And it's that, essentially, I think, that's the key to the crowding out view. Namely, that increased government borrowing might lead to higher demand for loanable funds, which we've seen, and then a rise in market interest rates on those bonds. And more generally, if interest rates are going up, that's the squeeze on, for example, planned private sector investment. So this is quite a good diagram to use if you want to support the loanable funds theory. However, it's, it's really important to be able to evaluate it quite strongly. So let's look at four points. First of all, the crowding out view is that government spending crowds out the private sector, pretty much pound for pound. Well, that's quite clearly nonsense, particularly if an economy is operating well below capacity. And also, critically, if there is a plentiful supply of saving, a plentiful supply of loanable funds in the financial markets, available to buy the newly issued government or state debt. So it's highly unlikely that crowding out will be 100% if you know, even anywhere close. Of course, the counter argument to crowding out comes from Keynesian economists. Keynesians believe in fiscal policy activism, particularly, especially when an economy is in a semi-permanent recession, there's a low level of private sector demand, uh, there's high unemployment, and there's a risk of deflation rather than sort of stimulatory inflation. Indeed, the Keynesians go further. They would argue, economists such as Paul Krugman, for example, would argue that a fiscal deficit, a government borrowing programme, actually crowds in private sector investment. That if you have a lack of private sector demand, you have to have some agent in the economy adding to the total demand for goods and services. And if government spending uh, or fiscal stimulus of another type is effective, that lifts aggregate demand, and then that can lead to an accelerator effect from the private sector. There's a lovely phrase here that well-targeted, so it might be a targeted stimulus, it could be a timely fiscal stimulus, depending on the cycle, it could even be a temporary increase in government spending, a particular response to a particular shock. So a targeted, timely and temporary increase in government spending of borrowing can actually help to absorb bring into play the underutilised capacity. And of course, Keynesians would argue there's a possible fiscal multiplier effect. Spend £100 million on some extra housing, add another £150 million to the school building budget, improve the amount of money being spent on, on the road system, for example. Those kinds of fiscal expansionary investment programmes can often lead to a multiplier effect, which in turn then generates employment and hopefully extra tax revenues, but it's partly self-financing. The crowding out view also argues, uh, I think crucially, that uh, the supply of loanable funds is, is kind of limited and restricted. But of course, in a globalised world, no one government, particularly a developed, rich, advanced nation, no one government has to limit its access just to domestic savings. Lots of countries have access to external finance through the international bond markets. Uh, so therefore, in theory, of course, there should be a ready 
uh, elastic supply of loanable funds available to meet an increase in government spending. And if you can visualise an elastic supply with a shift in demand, that doesn't lead to an increase in interest rates. So this slide, I think, hopefully gives you a feel for the critique of the crowding out theory. And I'll finish with some data, because data, I think, informs the answer in many ways. This chart shows the, the bond yield on 10-year government debt for the UK. Effectively, it shows the interest rate that the UK government has to pay on a 10-year loan, a 10-year bond. And you can see that during the 1970s, when crowding out became very popular, indeed, interest rates on government debt were high, significantly above 10%, and also volatile. You know, we never knew the government never knew quite what it was going to have to pay in interest on on the debt from from every bond issue going forward. Then, from there was another spike in the, the late eighties, the boom of the late eighties. But basically, since the early nineties, the yield on UK government debt has been falling pretty much constantly, yes, ups and downs. But look what's happened since nineteen ninety, the yield was twelve percent. By two thousand and one, it was down to five percent. And as we speak, the latest data through to the end of 2016, 2017, is that the yield on 10 year debt in the UK for the government is somewhere between one and a half and and two percent. In other words, the UK government, if it chooses to, can go to the bond markets and raise money over a 10 year period pretty cheaply. The, the real yield actually if one takes off inflation is close to zero, perhaps even negative. And I think this chart's important evidence. Bond yields are very low in the UK. And to my mind, as a Keynesian economist, this is a, a, a catalyst, a suggestion that the government should be spending more, investing more in the, pub, in the public services. This is the opportune time to do it. The risk of crowding out, in my opinion, is far less severe than it was 15, 20 years ago. So this has been a video looking at the crowding out view. I've been through the crowding out theory and hopefully offered you a critique of it uh, to help you with any question on sort of macroeconomics and in particular the whole debate about austerity and fiscal policy and uh, whether the government should be increasing its own spending and its own borrowing at this key time. Hope you found that useful. Lots more useful uh, videos to, to, to check out on our YouTube site. Uh, but for now, thank you.